So real quick, while they're talking, uh, they're basically going over all the behind the scenes shit or whatever. Uh, so, uh, the quarterly calls going on right now, we may not listen to the entire thing. I'm, I'm willing to bet they're probably going to tackle, first they're going to basically talk up, uh, uh, you know, basically profits and all that shit. It's like, oh, things are great. It's an investor call. They're going to be like, hey, everything's great. Everything's going awesome. Uh, and then they're probably going to, <clears throat> pardon me, they're probably going to, uh, oh, then segue into, oh, the delay is turned off. There we go. Thanks, Mazera. <laughs> you you can financial measure me all day. Hey, well, thank you so much. Maybe I will. Uh, so yeah, we're going to uh, listen in and see if they have any discussion or any any um, any uh, uh, um, uh, data they're going to put out regarding you know things that we that are relevant to us, relevant to us. You know, uh, uh, obviously, you know the Blizzard games um, uh, to see how Blackout performed. Uh, actually, Blackout was that more than three months ago? Actually, it was more than three months ago, I think. Um, but we'll probably get a follow up on that. Yeah, you know, wow, subscription numbers, all the good stuff. So here's the uh, earnings report. Let me go ahead and unmute it here and take a listen. We once again achieved record results in 2018. We delivered record gap revenue and gap and non-gap EPS. Just so you guys know, the layoffs are happening right now. So that's why I want to jump into this first. In 2018, we generated record gap revenues across all three platforms, and both Activision and King achieved record segment financial Oh, my lights are going crazy. While we had record performance in 2018, it didn't quite live up to our expectations. We didn't execute as well as we hoped to in 2018, and our current outlook for 2019 falls below what is possible in an industry filled with growth opportunities. We measure our success by growth in reach, engagement, and player investment. And while we had record financial results in 2018, we didn't achieve the reach, engagement, and player investment goals we set for ourselves. 2019 will require significant change to enable us to achieve our long-term goals and objectives. We're making changes to enable our development. These are the, yeah, the layoffs are the top of biggest franchises more quickly. Across our key franchises, Burden, thank you. we're adding development talent to 32. ensure our teams can deliver exactly what our fans have come to expect from our games. A consistent flow of compelling content. We'll also increase our focus on adjacent opportunities with demonstrated potential like eSports for Overwatch League and Call of Duty. We're staffing up production on our incubation efforts faster and increasing our investment in live services, in our tools, in our Battle.net platform, and in new areas like our fast-growing eSports and advertising efforts, but all with an intense focus on excellence so we never disappoint our players. Our pipeline is excellent and our development talent, the very best in the world. But we need to refocus our efforts so that Radical, thank you so much, production dude. resources are better aligned with our priorities. We're reducing or eliminating <laughs> investment in games and initiatives that weren't living up to player expectations or our leadership teams have determined may not live up to player expectations in the future it's going to be it's going to be investor speak initially to fund development investment. but it's important to hear what they're saying in certain parts of the business reduce complexity and duplication in our back Layoffs. office functions yep consolidate certain commercial operations and revamp our consumer marketing capabilities to reflect our continued migration to a largely digital network tlr we're going to lay off a bunch of redundant While this people isn't the shift in our strategy achieving better execution requires but what they determined are redundant change that requires new leadership and organizational commitment to change. We operate in an industry with proven growth and real potential, and we haven't grown at the rates that reflect the opportunities our industry affords. We have new business unit leadership committed to serving our players, our employees. Are we still live? You guys are still here, right? And oh, our shareholders. Okay. Weird. And I'm also very <laughs> pleased to have Dennis Durkin back as CFO and overseeing our emerging businesses. Came his back as CFO. Responsible stewardship of our capital. <laughs> Got and fat his bonus. Relationships with his colleagues served us well during his five-year prior tenure as CFO. Remember, he was always, he was there five years prior, and then came back, left, and they came back with a fat bonus. But especially today, our employees and our shareholders for their commitment and their support. And now, Cotty. Thanks, Bobby. Before we discuss the important steps we are taking to reinforce the foundation for future growth, let's first review our quarterly results. In Q4, we generated record gap revenues of $2.38 billion 
including the net deferral of $454 million. Net bookings were also a record at $2.84 billion. We generated Q4 GAAP EPS of $0.84 cents and Q4 non-GAAP EPS of $0.90, cents, also both Q4 company records, including the net deferral of $0.39. Cents. While GAAP revenue, hmm. net bookings, and both GAAP and non-GAAP EPS were company records, our net bookings fell short of our outlook due to factors I will explain in our segment results. Yeah. Activision Q4 segment revenues grew 6% Here, this, this year is the data you want to see, actually. $1.41 billion, and operating income increased 14 53 million year monthly year. active users for Activision, and then 35 million for uh, active users increasing double digits quarter for Blizzard. It's crazy. And then King, of course. The primary driver for the Activision segment was Call of Duty, mm -hmm. which generated more upfront sales than any other console franchise worldwide in 2018 a feat the franchise has accomplished for nine of the last ten years. I really enjoyed Blackout. Just Black Ops 4 sold through more units than Black Ops 3 in its launch quarter. I think it was deserving of Eight actually more than getting crazy sales because it was a lot of fun. Strong, with and that was just the VR side. Increasing versus Black Ops 3 as players enjoyed Blackout, multiplayer, and zombies. We also saw a significant shift to digital this year with full game downloads representing over 40% of console sell-through versus approximately 30% for World War II. However, sales of Black Ops 4 in the second half of the quarter were below our outlook due to weaker than expected retail demand, lower than anticipated pricing, and other promotional activities that didn't meet expectations. Hmm. Mighty Mick, what up, dude? Thank you so much. in-game net bookings started off slower than expected following the introduction of the new in-game system we were encouraged by the response we saw when we introduced mm -hmm. that is what circling content right here. with the second season of events in late Q4. Turning to Destiny, the highlight. mutual agreement with Bungie to sell back the commercial rights to Destiny and eliminate our ongoing investment in the game did not have a material impact on Activision segment operating income in the quarter. <laughs> That's how bad but Destiny was doing. We have capital and development resources <laughs> for the future. <laughs> We also continue to drive strong performance for the beloved intellectual property from our library. He 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 just, he just said we we lost Bungie, but like it didn't so what like it didn't impact anything. <laughs> Bandicoot, which has sold in over 10 million units since its 2017 release, again highlights the enduring nature of our classic. Franchise. Yeah, pretty much, Corey. They, yeah, it's Overall, just it's not doing anything. So losing it was nothing for, for that quarter. Revenue and for operating income, and with the changes we are implementing in 2019. We expect to drive even stronger performance in the years to come. Blizzard was a more nuanced story in Q4. On the one hand, we grew Q4 segment revenues to $686 million and operating income to $241 million. And Blizzard had 35 million monthly active users in the quarter as Overwatch and Hearthstone saw sequential stability and World of Warcraft saw expected declines post the expansion release this summer. On the other hand, the relatively consistent monthly active user trends for Blizzard's communities were not matched by in-game net bookings, which continued to soften. In particular, soften. Overwatch and Hearthstone both experienced sequential declines in net bookings from players making in-game purchases. Lastly, <laughs> Blizzard results benefited from the continued success of our business in China and the extension of our partnership with NetEase. Building on our 11-year joint venture, the expanded agreement runs until January 2023 and reflects the substantial value and opportunity for Blizzard's content in China. While the majority of the economics from our renewed arrangement will be recognized 2023, over the next that deal. Four years, wow. Q4 did benefit from the agreement, which was contemplated in our outlook. Now, I'll go into more detail in a minute, but increasing the flow and the frequency of compelling in-game content and upfront releases to serve the needs of our players is the number one goal set by the new Blizzard leadership team going They've been saying this for years. We, you play WoW, you know this. King grew segment revenue and operating income year over year as it continued to recover from the network incident experienced in the second quarter. Oh, I missed that. Q4 segment revenues grew 5% year over year to $543 million, and operating income increased 28% year over year to $207 million. King monthly active users of $268 million grew sequentially for the first time since we acquired the business in Q1. Just because I know this is like the least of everybody's worries here, the, the King stuff. But um, Candy Crush makes money because they continue to put out content. 
uh all of these like match three games that you know we joked about being you know casual games mobile games whatever um like they still put out my, my wife plays these games and they are consistently putting out content that's how they continue to basically make money they put out content at, at a better pace than than us than you know pc users especially wow players <laughs> like they just continually crank shit out because it because it makes money it keeps making money you gain momentum growing net bookings over 50 percent sequentially and again profitably as the team continues to execute against a sizable opportunity now Taking a step back and looking at our full year results for 2018, we delivered record gap revenue, gap and non-gap EPS, and net bookings. We continue to make encouraging progress in mobile. P.S. Uh, the reason why it sounds so like droney is because he, they they literally they're literally reading a script. They just sit there and they read the script, and then that's pretty much it. And at the end, I, I think they they answer like some questions or something like that. They they go to go off script a little bit, but pretty much the entire thing is scripted. Game monetization as quickly as we would like and that it is a transition year where we have less new major content to release than we should. So, we have worked with our new business unit leaders to undertake a comprehensive examination of our business to determine the changes we need to make to improve execution and capitalize on the substantial long-term growth opportunities for our company. We've determined that we need to refocus our best resources on our biggest opportunities and to remove an unnecessary level of complexity and duplication that is built up in certain parts of the business. Investing more in uh, yeah, esports, bottom left. A clear plan for this year to refocus and reinforce the foundation for growth. Deprioritizing games and initiatives. New business unit leaders, each of whom has demonstrated the ability to Azar, thank you. creative excellence with a commercial focus. 40 fucking months. Growth. Fuck. First. We are investing more in development for our biggest this middle one's important. franchises across upfront releases, in-game content, mobile, and geographic expansion. Second, we are deprioritizing initiatives that are not meeting our expectations and reducing certain non-development and administrative-related costs across our business. Third, we are integrating our global and regional sales and go-to-market partnerships and sponsorships capabilities across the business enabling us to better leverage talent, expertise, and scale on behalf of our business units. Our restructuring plan sheds investment in less productive, non-strategic areas of our business and will result in a net headcount reduction of approximately 8%, while also driving a significant increase in investment, focus, 8 and layoffs around our biggest family. How many employees do they have? We are confident that over time this plan will enable our teams to accelerate the delivery of high quality content to our community. Specifically, as we reallocate resources and hire new talent, we are planning for the number of developers working on Call of Duty, Candy, Overwatch. They have 9,625 employees as of 2018. So 800 people. By approximately 20% over the course of the coming year. For Call of Duty, Activision Management expects additional resources to deliver more frequent content updates and events for the franchise and accelerate its expansion across platforms and geographies. We also intend to build on our experience with the Overwatch League to launch a professional city-based Call of Duty League that drives franchise engagement and represents a sizable incremental economic opportunity. We are also increasing coordination across our Call of Duty studios with unified development leadership and more unified tools and technology to create a more consistent user experience and leverage our development scale and expertise. For Candy, King Management will increase its focus on growing reach and monetization with in-game content, yeah, probably. features, and events. Here's the thing, too. Like, MAUs is huge. Like, monthly active users is a huge number, right? I mean, look at King with, like, 300 or whatever, 20, 300 million or something crazy. Uh, Candy, uh, uh, Candy Crush, King, uh, those guys. Um, King is the developer. They acquired them some years back. Um, anyway, so the... Uh, uh, yeah, with, with Blizzard basically shifting and, and putting out more mobile games, they're going to uh, acquire a shitload of monthly active users, and that sells. Like, having those eyeballs, all those different people playing your game, that's huge versus just having a handful of people that play a game religiously. As ...where Blizzard has already established a regular cadence of major content and in-game operations. Additionally, Blizzard is investing in other Warcraft games, working on more ways for the community to engage with its enduring and beloved franchise. For Hearthstone, additional development Could we talk about Warcraft 3 or Forge? Maybe. Both broader Maybe. and deeper 
and to optimize the game to deliver an even better mobile experience for its global audience. And Diablo's development headcount will grow substantially as the teams work on several projects underway for the franchise, I, as I well hear that as first the part right? launch of Diablo Immortal. Overall, Blizzard's management Anyways. is reinforcing its pipeline with more resources than ever before to support planned mobile titles, several PC and console releases, and WoW's continued cadence of content. Finally, as a company, we will continue to invest in breakthrough new ideas and incubation with focused resources and some of our best creative talent. With 2019 set to be a quieter year for upfront launches, now is the right time to implement this plan. Work is already underway across the company as we speak. We expect to have completed quieter the North year. American Classic we know for sure. plan by the end of Q1, with implementation of the international components by end of year. And we have already started to increase developer resources on our biggest franchises and will be aggressively hiring talent in the coming quarters. As we look forward to the coming years, we plan for all of our major franchises to be operating at scale and capitalizing on opportunities that include robust ongoing live operations and regular content launches, both large and small, strong mobile experiences available for all of their communities to enjoy, new engagement and monetization models, including where appropriate esports and advertising. And underpinning all our franchises will be our deep relationships with growing and vibrant communities which are increasingly direct and digital. In short, we are refocusing the entire company to return to the franchise focus that has fueled our long-term success and to better leverage the scale of our business for future growth. I'll now turn the call over to Dennis to provide our outlook. For By the way, a lot of this stuff does make sense for, for a business. Thanks, Scotty. You see excessive right, growth, you hire a bunch of people, you end up having a lot of redundancies. Just wanted to take a moment to say how excited you let them go, back. you rehire to to people in the areas the you need. Position as the CFO, as Not well to mention, like what JD said, people, old employees end up making a shitload of money because of we have a lot you know, progression. Of in front of us, I see a stronger so that helps too. And more opportunities for long-term growth than ever before. By the way, guys, keep, keep an eye out on Twitter just in case. 2019 will be a transition year for us. I'm open mind too. Change to enable our teams to create better content for our biggest franchises more quickly. Given limited frontline releases, the organizational work underway, and the current competitive environment, we are planning for this year to be down year over year. I'll first go through the segments, including Slate, to provide some context for the outlook, starting with Activision. The main driver for the segment will be the Call of Duty franchise. Heading into 2019, we have momentum to build on given the launch of Black Ops 4, with the franchise yet again number one globally in upfront sales in 2018. What Gaz said. We will continue to optimize in-game content this year to drive ongoing engagement and player investment. And in Q4, we will have another major launch for the franchise that will appeal broadly to both existing and new fans with what I can only describe now as a great step forward in the franchise that is also rooted in some of the franchise's most important history. We have high expectations for the Blops game. Two remastered. For modeling purposes, we are conservatively, pl conservatively planning on upfront Q4 unit sales to be lower than Black Ops 4. We will also bring Call of Duty to mobile with our partner Tencent, although as you would expect, we take a conservative approach in assuming no material operating income from this initiative this year. Outside, outside of Call of Duty, we will release Sekiro in Q1, and our strategy of reimagining classic franchises will continue with Crash Team Racing on multiple platforms later this year. We will not generate material revenue from Destiny in 2019 following the sale of publishing rights to Bungie. Excluding Destiny in both years, our outlook is roughly flat for net bookings for the rest of the Activision segment in 2019. Hmm. Turning to Blizzard, we expect materially lower financial performance this year. 2018 benefited from the release of World of Warcraft, Battle for Azeroth, whereas we are not planning a major frontline release for Blizzard in 2019 and Blizzard exited 28 with softness for its in-game revenues that will take time to stabilize and return to growth. While these factors will weigh on Blizzard's financial, financials this year, looking further ahead, Blizzard's pipeline of PC, console, and mobile content is richer than ever, and we expect the significant addition of development resources to accelerate the pace of delivery over time. Finally, King is entering 2019 with momentum as it continues to recover from the network incidents it experienced in Q2. The business will continue to face tougher comps in the first few months of the year until it crosses the anniversary of this disruption. Nonetheless, we expect segment revenue to grow modestly year over year, driven by growth for the candy franchise and the continued ramp of our advertising business. 
Yeah, Candy Crush is going to make millions, company level, billions for years. Our outlook incorporates net bookings declining 13% year over year. The Blizzard segment represents the majority of this year over year change given its 2019 release slate and in game performance. The lower net bookings from Destiny is also a factor. The lower net bookings performance translates into lower segment operating income, and our outlook assumes a high teens year over year decline. Again, the Blizzard segment drives the majority of this change. Activision segment operating income is also expected to be lower due to the following factors. First, we are planning to invest more in Call of Duty this year, including to support platform and geographic expansion. And second, we will not generate meaningful operating inc income from Destiny this year. Although I would note that this is consistent with our planning assumptions were we to have continued publishing the game. Krell, that's a really good question. He did say no major releases. As we invest in candy marketing to build on the encouraging start for candy friends. Finally, I would note that we are planning for a higher tax rate this year. While our 2018 GAAP tax rate included one-time benefits from U.S. tax reform and our IRS settlement, both our GAAP and non-GAAP 2019 rates incorporate the full impact of new inter international tax provisions. With that context, context I'll de detail the financial guidance Trump for 2019 him. and Q1. On a GAAP basis for 2019, we expect revenues of $6.03 billion, including GAAP deferrals of $275 million. We expect net bookings of $6.3 billion. Product costs, game operations, and distribution expenses of 24%. Good point, Chef. expenses, including Good point. software amortization of 56%, and a GAAP-only charge of approximately $150 million relating to the restructuring plan Cadi outlined. We expect GAAP and non-GAAP net interest expense of zero, a GAAP tax rate of 24%, GAAP and non-GAAP share count of $775 million, and EPS of $1.18. For 2019, on a non-GAAP basis, we expect product costs, game operations, and distribution expenses of 24%, and operating expenses including software amortization of 46%. We expect a non-GAAP tax rate of 20% and non-GAAP EPS of $1.85, which includes GAAP deferrals of $0.25. Cents. Yeah, so so classic and Warcraft 3 Reforged, we don't know if they consider those major releases. So that's that's a tough one, right? They they did pre-sale Warcraft 3, so they already made money off of it initial, at least for pre-sales. They're probably not getting a ton of pre-sales this next quarter. So maybe he's just speaking to that potentially next couple quarters, you know. I don't know. It's tough. Including software amortization of 57%, and we expect approximately hundred million of the gap only restructuring charge to be booked in Q1. We expect GAAP and non-GAAP net interest expense of zero, a GAAP tax rate of 24%, GAAP and non-GAAP share count of $772 million, and EPS of $0.39. Cents. And for Q1 on a non-GAAP basis, we expect product costs, game operations, and distribution expenses of 20%, and operating expenses including software amortization of 43%. We expect a non-GAAP tax rate of 22% and non-GAAP EPS of $0.63, cents which includes the recognition of gap deferrals of $0.43. Cents. Turning to capital allocation, I wanted to spend a moment to quickly review our historical track record just as context. As most of you know, we have always taken a disciplined and balanced approach to capital allocation. We view a strong balance sheet as a strategic asset, and while our focus in recent years has been on paying down debt with over $4 billion repaid in the last five years, we've also returned almost $11 billion to our shareholders over the last decade with around $2 billion in dividends and $9 billion in share repurchases. With this balanced approach in mind, our board has authorized the following. A 9% increase in our dividend to $0.37 cents per share payable in May, and also a new two-year $1.5 billion share repurchase authorization. Before I conclude, I wanted to summarize the company's position heading into 2019. We continue to have a tremendous potential in front of us. Our combination of leading owned franchises, a direct digital connection to our consumers, best-in-class developer talent, and geographic, platform, and business model diversity creates a powerful foundation for longer-term growth. We must, and will, relentlessly focus on the world-class execution, business excellence, and quality content delivery that has been the backbone of our company and business for many years. Our plan to increase our focus on, on our core franchises is consistent with that approach and I am confident that executing against our plan will position us to deliver strong results and shareholder value over the long term. Looking ahead, I look forward to updating you on our results as we make progress throughout this year. 
Now I welcome real, our business leaders. Real quick, uh, before the Q&A. Yeah, the, uh, the stock rebuy is interesting. Uh, uh, some of this is kind of getting into the feels like I don't really understand, right? But, um, but I mean, if it's stock rebuy is like they're trying to get, collect more stock, get more stock back into their hands. <clears throat> that is interesting. I don't, I don't know what, what they would want to do with that because it's not like they're going to sell, I don't think. star one to ask a question. We'll go first to Colin Sebastian with Robert W. Baird. Oh, great. Thanks uh, for taking my question, and, and welcome back, Dennis. Um, I appreciate the comments on the restructuring and, and hoping you can provide a little more color on the reallocation of resources and, in particular, discuss how and when we can expect that effort to translate to a return to growth. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Colin. Uh, this is Kadi. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, you know, I guess stepping back, as we shared during the call, our plan is focused on delivering growth in reach, uh, engagement, and player investment. Possible and, guess, yeah. You know, really big three areas of it. One is refocusing on our own franchises, where we feel like we have the highest opportunity for growth. Uh, two is making sure we have the right amount of development resources to then go deliver great content within those franchises to our player communities. And then, where appropriate, benefiting from company scale and removing duplication and inefficiency. Uh, and so to do this with the new leadership teams, there's three specific and important changes, you know. That's uh, that's that investor fraud, Ains. <laughs> to deliver. The first is I'm going to err on the side of no. <laughs> on our main franchises. You know, as I mentioned, a, a 20% increase to drive the content and cadence and pace. Second is, is reducing and eliminating initiatives that are not meeting our expectations uh, and also areas where we can find uh, duplication and remove it. And then third, integrating our global and regional sales and go-to-market <laughs> and, really? and sponsorships so we can leverage scale. You know, we know we have a global and you know, fan player base that is looking for content on a regular cadence to come more quickly and to come across multiple platforms. And we think we have set up each of our operating divisions to be able to deliver on that. But we also think we've better set up the company to be able to deliver on that as we leverage those areas where scale can really help to bring our content and our franchises out to the world. Uh, as for timing, uh, you know, and as you see those effects, we're only guiding to 2019 today. Uh, but what I can say is that we are confident in the growth opportunity ahead of us. Our increased focus, you know, our investment, uh, leaning into our big franchises, it's a sign that we are headed towards a place where growth, given the right resources, given the right plan, can be realized. Thanks. Operator, can we have the next question, please? We'll now take a question from Evan Wingren with KeyBank Capital uh, Markets. Yeah, yeah. Um, just wondering if you could provide us a bit more commentary on the components of your guidance for fiscal 19, how you see uh, your franchises performing, and, and how you see the seasonality of the year unfolding. No, he wants like a quarterly yeah, thanks, breakdown. Uh, Dennis here, uh, happy to provide some color on that. Um, I guess first, just kind of helicoptering up a little bit, there are a few things to think about as it relates to our outlook. I think the first point is obviously the one uh, relative to our release, release slate, which is diminishing uh, this year or down this year, um, and it does obviously imp impact our outlook. Um, in addition, the in-game softness that we saw uh, exiting 18 uh, caused us to enter the year at a slightly lower trajectory than last year. And although we have a plan to turn that around, it's going to take some time. And so we don't actually assume a full recovery of that in 2019. And then we also are pretty conservative in terms of how we plan for some of the newer things in our, in our pipeline, like our mobile games. Um, we do uh, obviously uh, shoot for breakout hits, but it's very hard to obviously um, uh, prudently plan for those in your, in your outlook. So we're obviously more conservative on that. And then the last piece I would just say is relative to our tax rate. You heard a few of the comments about it, it being up because of some of our international considerations this year. So those are the main considerations, I guess, just relative to the overall outlook. As it relates to seasonality, um, given the limited number of product launches this year, Q4 will again be uh, a very important quarter. Um, again, we've tried to take a prudent approach uh, relative to that, assuming that Call of Duty units are down year over year in our outlook. Um, I would say that the team that's building this uh, new game for us uh, in Activision is, uh, is building what they believe is the best Call of Duty we've ever built. And uh, so that team is certainly targeting growth, even though we haven't uh, put in our outlook uh, in that fashion. So I guess just stepping back, uh, you know, our approach relative to guidance and my approach to guidance is really, for this year, is really consistent with how we've set guidance in the past. And, 
you know, a careful approach to guidance. It upsets me uh, that they say they're working on another Call of Duty game. <laughs> like, particularly this year, given the changes in the industry. Just keep that annual thing going, guys. This year. So thanks for the question, Evan. No, that's going to be like the third best Call of Duty I know. <laughs> we'll now take a question from Ray Stochel with Consumer Edge Research. Great. Thanks so much for taking my question. This is for Rob. Can you quickly tell us about how you are thinking about leading Activision and then give us an update on the Call of Duty Black Ops 4 launch and how that game is trending so far? Thanks. Hey, thanks for the question, Ray. So I've been at Activision for about 15 years now, and I've touched just nearly every part of the business. And what I really look forward to is you know, taking all those experiences and applying it in this broader capacity. You know, at a high level, I'm really focused on two things right now. It's our players and our people. Uh, you know, very simply, I'm very committed to our players and over-delivering on their expectations. That is just something we must do. Now, behind it all is our people. They're world-class. They are our foundation. And we want to continue to invest in you them guys are too much. to create an environment for them to do their best work. Now, if I step back from an Activision perspective and look at the business, we do have a lot of opportunities right in front of us in mobile, uh, in PC expansion, in geographic expansion, especially in Asia, in esports, as was mentioned on the call already, and of course in business models that uh, continue to arise in our industry and create opportunity for us. And as a division, we have specific initiatives against each of these in progress that uh, we're excited about. Now, in terms of Black Ops 4, um, as Cotty mentioned, it delivered better unit sell-through than Black Ops 3 in its launch quarter. So what we have is a really strong foundation of players right now, and our biggest objective is driving ongoing engagement with our community. Now, the good news is we have our best in-game content coming still. Our next event on February 19th will be what we believe is our biggest and best in-game event and it's gonna have significant updates across all modes. And we're looking forward to see how that lands and resonates with the community. And then if I look even further ahead to what Dennis mentioned, the, the, uh, um, it's we're gonna add grapples again. to this fall's launch, Blackout. I think is gonna resonate very powerfully with our community. It is an amazing game. It's gonna feature an entirely new campaign, a huge and expansive multiplayer world, and of course some fun co-op gameplay. But from day one, what gets me really excited is every time we've shown this title internally, um, it's just created a ton of buzz. Now, I wish I could tell you a lot more right now, but unfortunately you're going to have to wait, but I think it's going to be really worth it. We can't wait to share it with the world. Uh, so thanks for the question, Ray. And I would just add, Ray, to Bobby, that, uh, you know, that when you look over the last decade of Call of Duty content, I think that Rob is... Um, underselling what the internal enthusiasm is. I haven't seen this much enthusiasm that I can remember almost ever. So uh, we're, we're excited about the fall release of, of Call of Duty content. Great. Hmm. Thanks again for taking my question. Yeah, like Wildlands. I mean, he Our did say it expands the play world. Brian <clears throat> so. Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Thanks for taking my question, one for uh, Paul and Jay. I guess the question, Jay, is what, what is what is the new management team doing just to make sure that Blizzard is, is back on track to executing as one of the top studios as it, as it should be? Thanks. Very vague question, but still a good one, Yeah, I think. thanks for the question. You know, I think um, one of the things that I feel like it's important for us to talk about is, you know, we're a bit of a, a new leadership team and, you know, as we've come together, it's clear that, you know, we believe a lot in our future and that we have a lot to prove from both a game and kind of a content delivery standpoint. You know, I think we have a huge amount of opportunity. We have fantastic IPs. We have lots of games that we want to create. And we have a, a very passionate community that is hungry for all of the things that, that, that we can kind of produce. Just a little passionate. So we have two big goals going forward. You know, and the first one is, of course, to, you know, make excellent video games. The second is to, you know, find ways to deliver more content to our player communities. Um, you know, to meet these goals, we need to work to increase the amount of content that we're delivering. Um, right now, we have the largest lineup of PC, console, and mobile games that we've ever had. 
and we're working to meaningfully increase the development capacity and the development. This is like when Sarge gets that gets orders from command. Development talent is in red versus really blue. Us to make some some difficult trade offs. You know, we're gonna, you know, as Cotty mentioned, we're gonna reduce our non development positions in our offices around the world. Uh, specifically, looking at our SGNA and non core business units. Um, this was a very very difficult decision. You know, I'd say it's a, a top five career difficult kind of moment for me personally, you know, but we're committed to doing everything that we can uh, to help get us into a good position going forward. You know, we really want to serve our players and we want to serve our communities in the best possible ways and, and, and be a great creative organization. You know, as, as difficult as, as kind of all this is, I think, you know, we're, we're happy about the things that we're working on. Um, we're looking, working very hard to kind of live up to our mission. And, you know, we really look forward to the community and you all seeing the, the results of, of this increased development uh, work over time. I love to say uh, it's really terrific for the company. Welcome, Blank. Leadership. He's humble about his... Thank you so much for that. When you think about World of Warcraft and Hearthstone and the Warcraft franchise, uh, it's Jack, one thank of you. the most successfully led oh, franchises my, 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 in all of video games. And... Uh, we couldn't be happier to mobile have Jay exclusive. in the role that he's in. They're going to make a Call of Duty mobile game, though. They did, Great, they did allude to that already. <laughs> we'll now take a question from Alexia Quadrani like, with Modern JP Combat. Morgan. We already have Modern Combat 5 on, uh, on mobile. Thank you very so much. Um, it's not I guess my question is, given one of your competitors' Hold decision on. to launch a free-to-play Battle Royale game, are you th rethinking the monetization model for any of your own games, maybe including Overwatch? My girl, who's this? Uh, sure, who's this, this is Cotty. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I guess maybe a couple of key points. Uh, first, stepping back, one of the things that sometimes gets lost in the discussion around economic models is the player and game experience itself. Um, our North Star is to deliver compelling and engaging gameplay, full stop. Uh, without that, there are no economics. Um, the second but point Apex is, is, doing is that. that you know, the just, economic just model has to work with the franchise and the community and the gameplay. They need to work to reinforce each other. And we feel like we're in a pretty unique position, uh, honestly, across the industry in that we have multiple business models running at scale across our franchises today. We have uh, free-to-play games, microtransaction-based games, games with an upfront charge or with a subscription. Uh, and we also now have advertising, uh, which is growing as well. And we think that provides a range of options for our product and development teams to look across and pair the best economic model with the best gameplay experience. Uh, one thing we know, though, is that we need to be able to move more quickly, and we need to be able to rapidly evolve with the demands of our players and the market. And that's why, you know, as I mentioned, we are investing significant development resources in our core franchises to be able to move more quickly on behalf of our players and to be able to take advantage of new business models. Um, and on, you know, on the free-to-play part of your question in particular... Thank you. I was going to say, he hasn't answered uh, yet. Obviously, the most proven platform is mobile. So as we increasingly uh, bring Activision and Blizzard IP into the mobile space, you will see us deploy more free-to-play models. Uh, in, you know, embedded in your question, though, was also the fact that we see competitors now uh, on PC and console going free-to-play. And I just emphasize again that we believe our investment in resources coupled with our strong IP, leaves us in a really good position to take uh, advantage of evolving business models in our industry. The, the last thing I'd say, and it's just worth mentioning, is that the success we see with you know, titles like Call of Duty or even recent competitive launches shows that a really well-built, well-polished AAA experience for players can come still with an upfront charge, and it can be a great player experience and a great business. <laughs> or it can be free and have so that as well. Ahead, you know, we'll continue to evaluate all our games across our franchises and use the models that we think best, both for the player oh, experience and... That was and a poor games. answer. I mean, great for investors, I guess. Thank you very much. For us, it's not, that was not a good answer. Our next question will she come from she Mike Hickey If only she added company. PC to that list, or PC console, and excluded hey mobile. Guys, thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, just focusing on your King segment, I was hopeful you could provide some more color on your Candy Friends launch. Local Bowlers, thank you so much. And Let me just not really answer. Very helpful, thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is a King question, by the way. Hey, That's why I was talking King, over it, so. Here. 
Thanks for the question. Um, so Candy Crush friends. I know Kimasabi. I know. It's been a great addition to the franchise. The game uh, has really got a lot of great new game modes and mechanics. And uh, talk about really King Games uh, again. Polished title Mobile. Non Activision, non Blizzard. Uh, brought you know a lot of the franchise characters to life like never before. You know what I would say is that after many years of uh, the teams operating the Candy franchise at scale. They've really poured over. Yeah, he really didn't. He he really yeah. just basically said that and, uh, we, real we're quick, that just to go back to that last question, he basically said, to kind of TLDR, he said that we have a very diverse catalog and we're doing our best to deliver the best of everything. And you can do all that while also charging an upfront cost. That's essentially kind of in a nutshell. It's what he said uh, when she was, you know, talking about directly Apex Legends being free. And, you know, in doing in, in the way he phrased the way he phrased his answer, he's, he didn't really acknowledge the fact that the game also had all of that good stuff. We, we all agree that the game has good content, uh, good gameplay. It is a solid game that also happens to be free. So he's obviously avoiding all that because you can't really answer and say, well, we could deliver an equal experience. That, uh, you know, the teams have but also uh, we'll charge you up front. Uh, <laughs> engagement and monetization trends with some proven features uh, in the pipeline. Uh, to continue to delight the players. Um, so overall, very pleased with the momentum. And I expect uh, that the game will uh, really uh, help drive the Candy Crush fran franchise growth in 2019. Thank you. We'll take our next question from Tim O'Shea with Jeffries. Yes, thank you for taking my question. So with Overwatch C uh, League Season 2 launching soon, I just thought it made sense for an update on that franchise. It's been over two years since the game launched, and we've talked on prior calls and again on this call about the lower revenue levels. So I'm wondering what's the strategy to address this issue, and does, and does Blizzard have the development capacity to deliver sufficient levels of new content into this franchise? Thank you. Thanks for the question. This is Jay. Um, you know, I think it's important to mention the job the team has done with Overwatch. You know, we feel really strong about the overall IP, the universe, the characters, and the story potential, along with the global appeal for uh, for the game. And we've really built Overwatch League around that with uh, with early good results. You know, delivery of, of more content in Overwatch is something that's really important and something that we're focused on. You know, the team is delivering new heroes and new maps and new experiences. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, the, you know, the game revenue has declined recently. I think the community engagement with the game remains, remains strong. Um, there are a lot of new ideas for the Overwatch franchise. You know, we feel like the Overwatch that you know it's just a small part of what we can imagine for the overall franchise. And the team has you know, a very clear plan. In order to deliver on that, we're going to increase, increase the size of the Overwatch team meaningfully. Uh, but keep in mind that that's gonna, we're going to need to balance the existing live content with uh, new products and different kind of support for Overwatch League. You know, I'm really, I'm really confident that the community will be very excited when uh, we kind of release the, the, the things that we're working on. Regarding Overwatch League specifically, you know, we saw a great community response and lots of early success. That took a lot of focus, but overall we think it's the right decision. It's been the right decision for the game and for the franchise. We're about to kick off the second season, and that's going to start on February 14th. That'll, that'll oh, yeah, introduce cool. eight new city teams. It will introduce home <clears throat> and away matches for some teams for the very first time. Um, and the first uh, match that's actually going to kick off is going to be a repeat of the Grand Finals between London and Philadelphia. So overwatchleague.com is where you can see that. Can you watch some of that stuff? Great, can we have the next question, please? We'll take our next question from Brandon Ross with BTIG. After I'm done with StarCraft 2. Hi, thanks for taking the question. I was just hoping you could provide a little more color on your rationale for parting ways with Bungie and the Destiny franchise. Oh, this should be good. What happened with that game? Oh, this should be yeah. good. Sure. Thanks, uh, Brandon. This is Cotty. Uh, I guess let me say first that uh, we're confident that this was the right decision for both parties. Uh, Bungie gets to focus on the IP that they created, and we get to focus on our biggest opportunities, on our biggest franchises uh, with our best resources. Um, you know, our decision 
was reached via mutual agreement with Bungie to sell back the commercial rights. And for us, at least, it was rooted really in our strategy overall. Oh. Um, first, as you know, we didn't own the underlying Destiny IP. Um, and we do for all Welcome our other Jeremiah. major franchises, which we think is not just a differentiator for us in the industry, but also controlling the underlying IP gives us the chance to move in with new experiences and new engagement models, which also come with you know, new revenue streams. New platforms. And, of course, basically. structurally higher economics when you own the IP. And that leads to probably the second factor in our decision. Bungie didn't give them control. Is, you know, Destiny, it is highly critically acclaimed, uh, high-quality content, but it was not meeting our financial expectations. Um, you know, as we went through at the end of the year, our, our financial planning for 2019, it indicated that uh, Destiny would not have been a material contributor in operating income to our business. Uh, and third, How funny. we had internal resources supplementing Bungie's work. Um, and, you know, that means they're tying up one of our scarcest resources, uh, which is developer talent, uh, which now under, you know, the arrangement we've reached will be freed up after a short transition period. You know, so late last year when we were exploring all our options on Destiny, you know, in November after our earnings release, we learned that Bungie was willing to acquire we'll our talk in a and we engaged in discussions with them um, and ultimately wound up consummating the deal in late December and it was a mutual, amicable agreement. And, uh, you know, I just emphasize, I really do think for both parties, this is the right path forward, and it allows us to go implement the plan that we uh, talked about today. So. Thank you. So. Right, can we have the next question, please? This is this question. We'll take quick. our next question from Matthew Thornton with SunTrust. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Uh, maybe you could just update us on just timing around some of the mobile initiatives at, oh, at both Blizzard and Activision. Uh, including China as well as the rest of the world. Okay, TLDR, TLDR, uh, Bungie didn't give them complete control of the IP in order to put out to whatever they wanted to do and, and interpret it however they wanted, free-to-play, mobile, all that good stuff, right? And so they decided, you know what, you guys are not giving us the flexibility we want. Of our largest opportunities. You guys can take it. With our global IP, which we Tying up resources, just take it. To bring to the mobile platform. Um, we see this every day. Bungie's done support, by the way. You have a franchise at scale uh, globally. But we also see it with other great exactly gamer like Carson, exactly where bringing that game to mobile brought in tens of millions of new players that are engaging in an ongoing and deep way with us. Um, you know, the thing to note uh, is mobile game teams, while smaller than PC or console, they still require time to prototype and to test. And particularly for us and our franchises, where we have high community expectations, when we bring them to market, we want to do it right. That said. Part of the announcements today and the work that we're doing and that we highlighted is to make sure that we're adding the right resources and enough resources to accelerate our mobile pipeline. Given the size of the overall opportunity, it's not just internal. We are working with external partners. We have multiple projects underway across the portfolio um, in various stages of development. And as you know, we've announced two, Call of Duty Mobile and also Diablo Immortal. And, you know, you, you asked sort of about both in status. They're both hard at work. We have no additional announcements to make at this time. But in both cases, we're looking to make sure that the IP is really well represented. For Diablo, it's an authentic and immersive, deep experience that we think getting it there has large global potential, and so it matters to get it right. And we'll share more about our titles and release dates um, as that comes to fruition. All right, so nothing, nothing particularly new. All right, but... sir, we have time for one last question, please. All right, last question. And we'll take our last question from Kunal Maldi. Thank you. You mentioned that King advertising net bookings through more than 50% sequentially. It would be great if you could provide us with some more color in your expectations in 2019. King. <clears throat> Candy Crush. Well, hey, uh, hey, Bobby, I, I would uh, say... Oh, go ahead, Bobby. Go, go ahead, Umar. Oh, I was just going to say, Bobby, that um, I'm going to step back and just uh, think about the business kind of in a few phases. You know, first, uh, we you know, decided that we really needed uh, an ad product uh, that worked and is differentiated. So we went and invested in uh, the right teams. To, First to helicopter that. up. And uh, I think it's paid off. We have uh, a pretty good and differentiated mm. native uh, uh, ad product uh, that is working quite well with uh, player satisfaction on the inside and increasing our monetization. And in 2017 and what you saw in 2018 was we... Uh, scaled the business by lighting up more of our inventory and adding uh, more impressions in our network. And that was uh, a key driver as we started scaling the business. 
And uh, we hit some important uh, you know, financial milestones in the year, in 2018, uh, first profitability in Q1, and then growth in every quarter after that. And um, I think the ad business is going to start to be meaningfully uh, contributing to the king overall. Um, so we expect it to cross the 100 million uh, booking threshold uh, this year. And as I look ahead, I think on the next phase uh, about uh, where the ads business is heading, it's about continued scaling. Uh, so we will continue to uh, scale more in the inside the ads network at King. <clears throat> and we have more work to do there to uh, enable it in more of our games. And we're continuing to educate our demand partners on kind of the power of our ad product. And there's uh, really good momentum there. And I think kind of after that, we will think about even more ways to deploy the ad product. It could be in new mobile experiences or esports. I think the team has uh, a ton of learnings and potential that, uh, that could be applied in that. This guy actually gave a pretty thorough answer. <laughs> it's the most you know, thorough answer that. tonight. I think it's an excellent team. The ad product is excellent. They've started to make real inroads in getting people to better understand what the opportunities for advertisers uh, is. And uh, I think that uh, I'll just echo whom I'm sentiment that there's a lot of momentum uh, in that business. And that, um, I think, concludes our call today. I just wanted to, on behalf of our, our team here, uh, thank you all for your time and, uh, and engagement today. And we'll look forward to seeing many of you uh, on the road uh, or up to our next, uh, our next earnings call. So thanks very much. And this concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. There you go. All right. <clears throat> so I think the um, the uh, J.P. Morgan question, the J.P. Morgan question uh, about Apex Legends being free to play, um, that was probably the most interesting question of the call for sure because I didn't quite know. He didn't quite know how to um, like. It was, it was obviously, uh, there's, it's, on these calls, you can expect a lot of in investor speak. This is not going to be the same as when you go to a convention or something and you have uh, people standing on a stage basically presenting to a bunch of consumers. It's not going to be the same. So you're going to get a lot of investor speak. It's going to sound very droney, very robotic, very like buzzwordy and all that good stuff because they're speaking directly to their investors, their stockholders and everything. Ains, thank you so much for those three months. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to... You, I understand that it's 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 like you're listening to it, it's like well it's, who are these guys they don't know anything about the games or whatever it's like well they're because they're not really speaking to they're the business side of everything they're not really speaking to us but it is interesting to listen to these calls because then we can get kind of an insight as to what it is that they're thinking or how they approach certain things what their ideals are and everything like that and then hearing hearing him answer the question about Apex Legends talking about how uh, how they're able to because they have a diverse portfolio and a diverse approach to how they they uh, put out all these games and if you got to think between King Activision and Blizzard they have a number of different IPs like a shitload of IPs. Uh, and of course that's supported across a fucking ton of different platforms. And so what they're, what he was saying was, well, we, we look at the, uh, uh, as a whole, we can diversify enough where we're able to, you know, have free to play in some areas where it's not necessarily uh, needed elsewhere. And then when he tackled the free to play thing directly, he basically said that you can, uh, you can put out a quality product that has, you know, good gameplay and ga gauge of gameplay and all, and all that good stuff. Um, but at the same time, charge an upfront box fee. So that's, that's, that hurts a little bit because he, you know, he's basically saying that, uh, you know, he's implying that, um, Apex Legends could have essentially made more money for their for their shareholders, right? Uh, if they had a box a box price because they, you know, people would have paid for it, and that is not true. Uh, that is not true. If 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 Apex Legends was launched with a box price. People would have just been like, no, and and, and uh, uh, loot boxes from EA, like even in their own interviews with the developers of the game, right, with the heads of of, of that studio, uh, uh, they were still they were like, listen, we we just launched it because I mean it's required by EA loot boxes, like people were gonna shit all over us, so we just like released the game, uh, and so there, you know, him implying that oh they probably could have made more money that way because because that's the way we would have done it. Uh, that is, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, that is um, that really makes that question probably the most interesting because it just means that you know Blizzard is still uh, or Activision Blizzard is still is still attached to the box price. They still like that upfront money. Uh, you know, versus now, you know, now EA has gotten a, a really good taste of, hey, hold on a second, we released a game that was free to play and had loot boxes and people are fucking loving it. 
And so now EA could probably look at that, depending on what their earnings are over time. I mean, and again, let's go back to what I said at the beginning about having those monthly active users is massive. So, so uh, uh, Apex Legends having 25 million uh, installs or users, that's huge for a game that's only been out for like a week and a half, two weeks. So this is, a well, a week and a half? Yeah, a week, a week and some change, a day. Uh, and so those MAUs are are huge. And so EA might value that more than, uh, than say, Blizzard does. But again, Blizzard's taking a different approach where they're saying, oh, well, we're, we're going to expand out into the mobile market where the MAUs like, are going to skyrocket. If you look at King with 325 million monthly active users, that's massive. Again, that's that's a different set of eyes. Or, sorry, that's, 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 you know, 325 million, you know, sets of eyes that they're getting and so EA is now kind of getting a, a firsthand taste of like, OK, how much money can we make off this product uh, off of, of putting out a product that doesn't have a box price? And so now I'll go back to like Battlefront. Imagine Battlefront releasing with you know, free to play with, you know, and again, this is just like this is pipe dream this right uh, Battlefront releasing with just um, uh, just their microtransactions. And it was free to play, you know, potentially could have been even more uh, uh, more profitable if they had done it that way, that way and even more accessible to the user, like more. Uh, 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 liked by the uh, the consumer base it would have been like you know it's like yeah they have they have you know they have microtransactions you know the uh, the buffs aside right just talk about like you know cosmetics and all that good stuff um, but more people probably would have played it more monthly active users that sounds good on an investor call stock price goes up right so I'm interested now in what EA's marketing call is going to be or investor call is going to be like which I think is probably should be happening sometime soon I, I didn't check the schedule or anything this is actually just popped up I totally forgot this was happening but yeah woo man how finished game uh, how finished game can make money too uh it's all digital now they just charge for new stuff you play tackles this by having a box price in their games and then crazy sales like two months later for the next to free right yeah actually we've seen that happen a lot uh what gets me is that ea launches apex legends right before anthem that is very yeah, you're right that is quite insane for them to do that that is pretty pretty crazy um <clears throat> i'm actually very curious what will happen uh, oh they already did their call okay yeah i totally missed it um i was i was so busy playing apex legends I said you pay attention to what these calls were. Um, that call, that that call actually made me want to sell my stocks. I actually just sold. I sold my uh, uh, my last. I was holding on to like one last Activision stock. I, I sold it. I think like uh, end of last year or something like that. But um, yeah, EA might be pretty confident about Anthem. But uh, I, I, we won't know what the results of of this uh, um, of, of Apex Legend is until the next quarterly call. So we we'll have to you know check back in in three months. <laughs> and we'll take a look at the, the the quarterly call and see how Apex impacted the bottom line for EA and what they're saying about it. <clears throat> hey, you watch your Apex vid. I'm so fucking bad at it. Well, you're not going to get much help from me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it'll be hilarious if Apex makes more, a uh, ton more money than Anthem. Yeah, no, and that's the thing. It's like with games like that, look at Fortnite. Fortnite has seasons, right? So who, eventually you might actually get seasons or something similar in Apex Legends where you're going to have uh, you know, reasons for people to come back, get more, you know, get more, um, uh, maybe another hero or le another legend, uh, get more skins, all that good stuff. So, uh, there it is, right? Apex uh, season start in March. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Apex season start in March. Um, so yeah, they've already got a roadmap. There it is right there. So, so that's, that's, they're going to do basically the same thing that Fortnite did. And they're going to continue to make money over time. Uh, once they have the install base and it's easy to get people back, you know, you already own the game, technically own the game. So here's a bunch of new stuff. Do you like it? Come on, play it again. <clears throat> um, yeah, wow. Just just a really interesting call. I'm actually curious what all the uh what are the all the hot takes are. Oh fuck. All right. Well here's the first one. Hold on. So so switching gears back to the uh to the layoffs. Um you guys remember Zarina? Uh she's a cosplayer that ended up uh, uh working at Blizzard. So she says, Hello friends, I'm looking for career opportunities. If you're looking for an experienced content communications manager that's incredibly detail oriented and good at untangling production production pipelines, please let me know. Myself and my entire team were affected today. Um, so she's the uh, global community content manager, by the way. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure building up the Hearthstone global Hearthstone community and global communications efforts these past three years, six years. Lindsay and I actually did an interview with her. She's, um, I mean, you know, she's great, obviously, but a lot of great people are going to be laid off, you know, today. So it's not, it's not necessarily about whether or not, you know, these are really great employees. Uh, it's, it's more or less about, you know, reduce reduction in headcount and everything. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm just trying to keep an eye on certain things, just kind of see what's where people are at here. Um, I don't have any news from Josh, uh, but um, you know nobody really knows if they're gonna get laid off until it happens. So I guess we we'll have to keep an eye on Josh's Twitter. Uh, I, I really, I, I mean, obviously, I hope that he doesn't. But you know, I'm I'm a little selfish as somebody who you know does this this whole thing for a living. 
you know, I, I feel like Josh is very, very good at it. And I think given another opportunity to doing so, especially in today's climate, what he's doing and everything, uh, I feel like he could be very successful if we were to go and go alone and just start just start streaming full time. Um, because, you know, think about it. When he first did it, that was like, what, five years ago or something like that? Before he started working for Blizzard? Five, six years or something like that? Like, that was a different climate altogether. That was not, streaming was not as big as it is now. So uh, we were making YouTube videos and shit, trying to make money after Adpocalypse. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I personally, I mean, it sounds bad, but, you know, I hope Josh, I hope, we, I hope we get to let go. So that way he could uh, uh, go and be success, a successful, uh, uh, you know, independent, independent streamer, you know, just doing his own thing. I feel like he'd be really good at that. Maybe then he have time to return to Gigi. <laughs> It'd be more RT time, RP time. No, if he had time, if he had more time, I'm sure he'd probably want to expand and do a couple more things. Not to mention, he's already made a bunch of new friends. <laughs> he made a bunch of new friends, so that's a bunch of new shows and everything he could probably uh, uh, work around and do, if he's interested in doing shows, that is. So, um, yeah, I feel like Josh would be very successful if he were to let go. I mean, I would, I would suck. I'd be like, hey, dude, I'm sorry. But also, go get him, Tiger. <laughs> Uh, the call sounded like it was depending on what your job was and less about performance. Exactly. Yeah. That's pretty much what it is. I mean, you got to think when you have 9,600 people, uh, you know, you probably have, you know, at least this is low ball. It's like 4,500, like really good fucking employees scattered throughout all these departments. There's no way you're going to be able to go through and really look at, you know, even whether or not you have like uh, quarterly reviews and all that stuff on hand with like rating systems and all that, because they have like really detailed, weird, like, you know, uh, 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 scoring systems whenever you get the, your quarterly reviews now. Um, you don't know if, <clears throat> if, if you can't really go through and like, like pick people out and move them around. That's like a, that's a lot of work to move 4,500, like really good people around. So, oh, man, 9% is very significant. It absolutely is. Um, <laughs> so Josh, tell me what you think about Blizzard now. I, he's, I, I, I know he wouldn't say anything. <laughs> he wouldn't say it. maybe in like two years he'll probably start being like, well, it did kind of suck towards the end or something. I don't know. Whatever he would say, I have no idea. I'm just making that shit up. Um, every time was a reduction number, but then they said a twenty percent investment in developments. Well, those numbers, those numbers are not exactly like they don't necessarily correlate. <clears throat> Thank you, C. Madrid, Mr. Boy. Uh. Like you can't really look at okay eight percent in one department twenty percent in another because we don't really know what the hey. what those numbers are as a whole. Hey, welcome back. That should be a welcome back, right? It's, why did it only say? I don't know. We'll see, Madrid. Hey, thank you. Um, yeah, it's 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 I'm 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 curious what the number is. We say twenty percent investment in, into development uh, and eight percent reduction in uh, in you know they're basically they're trying to restructure and 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 here's the thing even though a lot of people are being let go there's going to be a lot of folks that are going to be in either redundant positions or in jobs that you know maybe they don't necessarily need anymore like does here does heroes of the storm really need to have a support team right now like a massive support team probably not you know they're probably just re, you know, re and i don't know how they structure these things by the way uh but if, if it was me if i had a, a team that was dedicated to world of warcraft and a team that was dedicated to this and that i would much rather just train somebody that's the closest to that game to basically cover it with like a big ass booklet of things to research whenever they need something or like you know uh or a stack overflow of uh of consumer of uh um, questions that you might be asked where you could basically go through and answer and help uh, support people on uh, on HOTS. HOTS is probably on a skeleton team. Yes, I already know like some folks have been moved around. I don't know if they're actually still there though. And we won't really know unfortunately until the end of today because people again are being uh, notified right now that um, that they're being let go. Let me see. I'm, I'm, I'm just checking on uh, Twitter right now <clears throat> to see what's up here. Uh, as of today, I am no longer an employee of Blizzard Entertainment. It wasn't, wasn't my choice. I wanted to retire here. Oh, man. Oh, that's the fucking worst. Oh, that hurts. That hurts. That hurts. Um, I, it hurts to hear that. It hurts to hear that. Because, you know, Blizzard was the dream. Somebody left a comment, uh, I think, on uh, uh, the last uh, YouTube video and every, uh, that I put out, the news, the news video. Let me see if I can go and find it, because it really, it's a really good comment that really kind of sums up, um, you know, what, what, what it was supposed to be like working at Blizzard. Uh, if it's just, I'm waiting for it to load here. Apparently, YouTube's running a little bit slow. Come on, YouTube. Come on, get it going. Um, here we go. Uh, epic, epic, epic. Let me see. Okay, well, I can't find it. But basically, uh, he said that Blizzard was the place that you were supposed to go. Like, that was like the dream. That was the dream job to go and work at uh, at Blizzard. <clears throat> yeah, I can't find it. Uh, but 
you know, now it's like people who, who set their, they set their sights on like, yeah, I'm going to work at this job. It's going to be amazing. And then I'm going to retire and it's going to be awesome. And it's just like, their dreams are crushed today. Just crushed. Now, as somebody who has, you know, been, I've been doing this for, you know, in this industry, kind of working with folks in the business side and obviously doing content and everything for over 10 years. Uh, you know, one of the things that you realize early on is that, um, uh, uh, is that there is, there is a, a, there is an attrition. There's like a rotation of, 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 of people. You're going to basically go, uh, uh, you're going to have people that are going to work somewhere for like two years. For me, like I tell people, it's like, yeah, you got a great job in the games industry, two years. Like that's typically like the numbers, like two years, basically until we stabilize as an industry, which is basically what basically means is it's like until we stop getting like shit loads of money from like external companies and investors and start throwing them, like just throwing them out there and spending money, hiring a bazillion people that we don't need. And then that are later made redundant uh, until we figure out how to better streamline that process. Like you're going to have an attrition rate of basically people rotating in and out every like two years or so. Uh, <clears throat> from Mark Kern, when Blizzard ordered me to lay out 10% of my team after shipping WoW, I vehemently disagreed. Uh, they had just gotten done with a massive crunch. It wasn't fair. They told me we're a real company now. That's when I decided I needed to leave. <clears throat> I, Mark, Mark Kern, you gotta, you gotta remember, Mark Kern hasn't been, uh, at Blizzard in, <sighs> fuck. I mean, I appreciate his insights, and he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna put them out there. He's pretty active on Twitter when it comes when it comes to this stuff. But like, the Blizzard that he worked for is a completely different Blizzard than what it is now. You can argue whether or not one is better than the other. One is a growing company that's kind of going, budding from you know uh, from a startup, a uh, small indie company. You know, not indie, but you know, small company to turn into like a full fledged multinational in you know uh, uh, um, you know um, you know industry, and then uh, and then now being you know, a globalized market, you know, but with tons of shareholders and, and, and partnerships and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a big difference between when he was there and what it is now. Um, and so a lot of times it's like when you read his comp, when you read his, when you read Mark Curran's commentary on some of these things, it's like, yeah, that's, that's true. Not sure if that applies here though. One is an Activision, other is not. I think it's kind of a clear result there. <clears throat> Desire a case of you either die as a hero or live long to become the villain. Yes, that is exactly what it is. And that's what happens. That, that, that's just, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that's what happens. You know, you have, you have people or you have companies that, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll start off small and they get, um, they get picked up by somebody. And, and, you know, like, I mean, I have my own personal story for the company that I used to work for, you know, went through the whole, um, you either die as a hero or live long, long enough to, uh, to become the villain. You know, when I first started working for this company uh, back in 2006, um, it was a uh, uh, we were just acquired by Yellow Pages and then Yellow Pages merged with um, uh, with AT&T and then they created AT&T Interactive. And so that was over the course of like a couple years. And so what happened was everybody that was there initially and in the, the bottom, basically the first 100 folks or first 20 folks, whatever, that was uh, that the, they looked at it like, oh, man, it's become this monster that I want to be a part of. So for them, it became the villain. But for people like me who are part of that transition phase where, you know, we we started off and we had the. Um, you know, the, the, like right when I got hired was basically right when they were acquired by yellow pages, like within a month. Uh, and so I wasn't there part, I wasn't there in the initial group, but I saw the transition. And for me, it was a great job, even through the parts where people were like, oh, well, the things are, are shitty now. But for me, it was like, what well, things are fine. So, you know, the live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Like, I guess it depends on your, your perspective, where you're at within the company or outside of the company or as a shareholder or whatever. Uh, it's, it's tough to say, like, it's really tough to say what you know if if they have become the villain yet but is it the same company that it was no is it is it the hero <laughs> that's that's subjective <laughs> so yeah it's tough it's tough i'm still scanning i'll scan uh, twitter a little bit more here oh man this is rough sad day for many yeah christina zarina let's see I'm just kind of scrolling through because people are retweeting people's uh, tweets and saying that they are no longer. Oh, here he goes. Another David Ellis. Uh, oh, that's, that's 343. That's not that's not someone that worked there. Seeing some uh, friends in web and mobile at Blizzard let go. Yeah, I guess we won't know until the um, until the end of uh, um, until the end of the day. What 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 you know, what people are going to uh, say. 
Is it easy to delete clips people post? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. But if they post it to like live stream fail, it gets mirrored right away. So it's kind of like pointless to delete it. <laughs> Why? Why? What, what, what are you making? What do you got? Uh, one of the perceptions of Blizzard games will go down uh, if the company's reputation drops. Oh, God. What do you have? I guess most of not all layouts have been adjacent positions and not direct development. Probably. Hold on, let me hear. What did you clip here? But, you know, I hope Josh, could, I hope we get to let go. So that way he could uh, uh, go and be success, uh, successful. But, you know, I hope Josh, could, I hope... yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I bled my words together and you, could, you couldn't clip that. So, so yeah. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> oh, man. So why is this layoff happening for a simple person? Um, right, well. It's basically teams that they have they have deemed to be um, either redundant or not necessary in the current uh, for yeah, basically going forward. So, so you yeah. see it right back. I hope Josh. Yeah, if you could if you could trim it a little bit more, it might it might work. He's a smart guy. He he won't come at me for that. <laughs> uh, let's see careers at EA. Uh, let's see start here. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's funny. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, Mike, the IT guy, I'm now seeking employment on opportunities. I wonder what he did. I'm looking at their, I'm actually looking at their, um, their descriptions or their, uh, uh, uh their, uh, bio to see, like, what they did. Warm water. Hey, 37 months. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Uh, transformative active directory DevOps and PowerShell nerd. Okay, so he worked in, uh, in, in, you know, I don't, I don't know necessarily exactly where that'd be, but maybe SysOps or something like that. So we have like, we have basically content managers so far, sysos, what is this other guy here? Uh, what is Caden? What do you do? A sysos community manager. So yeah, so compute. That, that's a little scary, actually. This guy was a community manager for Warcraft. Uh, assistant community manager. I don't know. I don't know if that necessarily means that. I don't know what that means exactly, but. Huh. Where's Josh? Let me pull, I'm going to pull up his, I'm going to turn alerts on for Josh. I'm actually worried. <laughs> I'm actually worried. Nobody wants to be let go. Nobody wants to be let go, right? Let's see. He hasn't said anything yet, so. <sighs> DevOps is like IT supporting the developers. Thank you. Yeah, while CNs were expected to be hit, he was Josh's PA. <laughs> Yeah, CMs do always get hit because when it you know when a game launches or when it has a you know a major expansion or something like that, like you always you're always gonna have to hire more people to for the support side of things. And then as things kind of even out or kind of trickle or kind of uh, fade, you, you know those people are gonna be redundant. Carries a coffee for the man. He carry he carries a salt for uh, he he maintains the salter for Josh. That's why I left the CM space. I couldn't handle the up and down. Yeah, that's yeah right. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> if he starts <laughs> if he starts streaming, you would know. Uh, actually, he'd probably go out for some drinks. Oh man, Ugh. I'm just thinking like if Josh gets let go, like I, 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 I wish I lived closer so I could go out and have a drink with the guy because, yeah, it's just it's just another it's just another like you know, major fork in the road in his life in the in the games industry, and it's just like I want to I want to be there for him. Be there. Start trying. No, I know Teddy. Right. Start driving. I could get there. I could be there by uh, by probably seven o'clock. Oh no, traffic. Fuck. I'll be there by tomorrow. <laughs> uh, why does it feel like they're letting go of all CMs? They they you, they really don't want to put every single tie into the community. Uh, communities are what make your games great. That's true. Katsuki's correct. Ain't not nothing. Just resud for sixteen months. Skype him. What is what is a Skype? <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm, I don't want to bug him. I already, I already talked to him. I already talked to him. And, you know, he did, obviously, obviously, this is not like inside information or everything or anything. He didn't know whether or not he was going to be let go. Nobody fucking knew whether or not they could be let go. So, you know, as of right now, we just basically wait. When is installing this new Skype app, this next update? Man, <laughs> they fucking installed and then launched that bitch on me. I was so bad. He was so happy and proud when he got the job. It was like a dream job. Yeah, Penny. You know, I don't. I, again, I don't know where he's at now. Like he's he's got so many. Uh, uh, he's got so much. He's had so much success uh, outside of, of of working at Blizzard too. So, you know, wherever wherever his head is at in terms of what he wants to do with his future. 
How much does Bobby fucking Kotick make? <laughs> Someone tell Panzer he makes like $12 million. I think I think it's what it is, isn't it? Hold on a second. Uh, that's pretty easy to find out, by the way. By the way. Bobby Kotick, uh, 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 yearly. Let's see. There's like, the, it's public information, so you just gotta look it up here. Uh, 28 million. Yeah, 28 million. You're right. You're right, Saren. Uh, what I say, 12 million? Yeah, I totally lowballed that. <laughs> <laughs> his base pay, his base pay is 1.75 million. <laughs> oh man. His base pay is 27 is uh is 1.75 million and his total compensation is 28 million. Oh man. Oh man. We need to start a GoFundMe, I know. Small any small any developers, right? Ah, <sighs> you know, it's, I don't, I don't like the pay, like C-level positions getting like insane pay, like versus somebody who's entry level, like that discrepancy between like, I mean, you look at, you look at the, um, uh, uh, look at just like the United States as a whole. And you think about the wage gap between the highest paid person and the lowest paid person. And then like you, and now you think of like just an individual company, a single company like Activision Blizzard, which, you know, I'm not trying to play down like a small company or whatever. This is a big company, but still, it's not the same as like, like at the, the United States as a whole, but still as a small sample size, looking at how much Bobby makes and also all the other C-level guys uh, versus what somebody like, you know, an entry level position at, at Blizzard as like, you know, a CM or something like that, uh, would they'll probably make like, I'm just gonna say, probably 60,000, right? Um, between 40 and 60,000. Uh, I don't know exactly how much somebody would make there, but still you figure, let's say 50,000 is a nice round number, entry level position at Blizzard full-time position with with benefits and everything like that's such a such a huge such a huge gap uh that it's painful it's painful because you think about like how many people could you support at that rate like how much money was was uh, uh zarina making before she got to let go uh this guy kaden how much money was he making you know was he making six figures a hundred thousand dollars something hey. like that still that's still like, you know, a drop in the bucket when you look at how much a C-level position gets. And then you'd look at all the C-level positions all put together and it's just like, wow, how many jobs could we have saved here? But again, I don't wanna, I don't want you guys to think that it's all like, uh, I mean, the money part sucks. Like that's bullshit. I do think that's bullshit. But the positions, it very well could have been that they are, they were indeed not uh, relevant positions anymore that they were in. But everything we're, everything we're seeing is like, they're all CMs, like community managers. We've got like two out of the three that I found have been community managers. So yeah, that's a tough one, man. <clears throat> man. Will this be on YouTube? Oh, I guess I probably could cut it out and put it on YouTube. Should probably do that. Thanks for watching.